get it. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, just want to, three of us want to introduce each other because uh, you may not know some of us. So, sure. So, um, thanks everyone for staying till the end. Hopefully, we have some really <laughs> cool projects to show you. Um, so, I'm Nikolai. I actually work for InterSystems with Dr. Chi Lee, and I got uh, pulled into this project. Um, and you'll see we have some really awesome results in training an AI model to directly respond and create I2B2 queries from natural language instructions. My background is in machine learning, uh, originally computer vision, now large language models. And we're going to take you through the whole process as well. Mike has got a great demo um, of the AI model. And so uh, I have a quick question for the audience. Who has used the I2B2 query tool before September? I had never seen it. So you'll see that we had some really cool results despite <laughs> never touching the tool um, and also uh, part of the core team as well as Chris. So again, thanks for st sticking around. Um, it's been a, a, a yeoman's work by Nikolai and, and Mike really um, took the ball and ran with it. Um, their enthusiasm and, and uh, um, professionalism is, uh, is really uh, quite amazing, which you'll see. Um, you know, we did this, we embarked on this as a proof of concept to really um, figure out how we could fail gracefully, right, where the edges of the problem were, right, we wanted to be able to uh, sort of from a requirement standpoint to uh, take some of the um, constraints that Sean was talking about and, and do that for real. Um, so, you know, we were tackling issues with, you know, safe harbor and moving data around sort of the ETL, a lot of the ETL tasks. Uh, we were uh, tackling issues around uh, having enough horsepower to train a model, uh, to fine tune a model, um, versus just to run the fine tuned model. Um, we had to select the kind of uh, language model we were gonna we were gonna utilize. Uh, Llama was a was a great choice because of its accessibility and um, and and uh, ability to run locally. Um, and and we'll we'll go into that a little bit more, but we use a sort of a, a, a variant, a fine-tuned, if you will, version of Llama called Code Llama, because uh, the task was instead of uh, um, we, we weren't going to interrogate uh, the we weren't going to build a language model around the clinical data. We we wanted to build a language model that spoke XML that spoke I2B2 XML so that we could create natural queries uh, or queries in natural language and then have them executed by I2B2 so we didn't have to worry about the uh, you know clinical data um, regulatory issues and, and the like so um, just you know again thanks to uh, Nikolai and to, and to Mike for really um, doing a fantastic fantastic job here so uh, so my name is Mike Mendes. Uh, I think I know a lot of you. Uh, if not, I've been with the I2B2 project since the beginning with like Diane, Sean, and Zach. Um, so yeah, so it was an interesting project. Um, and this uh, actually started out in the ETL working group. We kind of were thinking about something to do for this project, for this conference. And then all of a sudden, just kind of snowballed. It was like, a, I, we want to do something simple, and then it just snowballed, and then you got this amazing demo. Nicholas and Chris did amazing jobs. It was just unbelievable. But anyway, okay, so we could talk forever for that. But okay, so I just want to give a quick agenda. It's very quick. We're basically going to talk a little bit about this AI build that we did. What we learned, we had only like three weeks that we worked on this, and we learned a lot. And uh, so and then we're going to go a little bit into like a background of AI and LLM. Um, and then some of the benefits of it. Then we're going to show this actual demo that we actually did, and then uh, future stuff. Uh, so we started out by basically we just wanted to say um, how many uh, patients have diabetes and is taking metformin, and we just were hoping we, we'd actually just get the XML generated that the query builder takes, and. So we actually did that fairly quickly. We did that within like a week. Uh, so then it was like, okay, well then we got this new UI that Nick Bennett had done and let's just integrate this together. And so then we started adding all these components together, realizing that um, 
there's just too much to do like, within the client. So then we ended up creating a new cell. We created an ITP2 cell, and as Sean talked about yesterday, it just has to take an XML and spit out XML. Whatever is inside of it can do whatever it wants. In this case, we're actually yeah, taking the XML. Um, so one thing I do want to emphasize is in this demo, everything is on the MGB, uh, on a server on MGB. None of this is going to chat GPT, none of this is going to Google or Microsoft, it's all on-prem. And so, um, yeah, so that's, so we were able to actually execute the query and come back and we use the new UI. Um, so we are actually gonna demo this, but this is kind of, you just type in what you want and then the screen on the right, this is one similar to what Jack, uh, Zach showed, is this is the actual XML that Nicholas was able to amazingly do, which is unbelievable. You type that in and then that's what comes out. And then that got sent to, so originally we were looking at this and like, oh, this is, gr I, I looked at this, I was like, this is beautiful. And then I started looking closer at it and the item key, see how it says that I sniv, it, it's, kind of right, but it's not. That's why we had to create the cell. What we ended up doing was we took the item name and we sent that to the ontology cell. And the ontology cell came back and gave us the proper item key because the large language module was kind of modifying that and it was never gonna. So that's some of the validation we were forced to, that, that we basically learned from this. And so once we did that, we actually recreated a new XML and that's what we sent to the CRC, and then the CRC would actually run this, and then it would put those items in there. And to add a few comments uh, here, yeah. you know, as, a, as someone new to IDB2, someone who's never used the query tool, and really I love working in SQL, that's sort of my bread and butter. Um, I had worked a lot with large language models, and the goal of this whole AI project was really to enable access for people to do faster queries. I would like someone like Nikolai or anyone else really in the field to not need to learn the query tool, not need to know ICD-10 ontologies, not need to know SQL to do effective research. Instead, I could take, you know, and I've even had my, my parents do this where I say, I wanna find, you know, people with, you know, some disease I had five years ago and have the XML come out. And that's really the whole point of AI is to enable that very, you know, niche tools that are super powerful in their own right to be more accessible. And so I wanna set that stage here is that Good. That was my inspiration through the whole project. And I think that hopefully as this rolls forward, you know, we can really expand the I2B2 community um, from not just you know, core researchers, but to a whole suite of researchers that really just know English. And so that will be the new programming language uh, for a whole series of tools, hopefully in the future. Yeah, no, I agree. I'd also just like to comment on, on the high fidelity hallucinations that it was producing because um, to the naked eye, to, to, the, to the layman, um, that uh, uh, that item key didn't particularly stand out as being wrong, and and this is where um, uh, where Zach uh, yesterday uh, was was talking about trust but verify, right? This is so the the workflow that we established has a breakpoint in it that allows the inspection of the the XML prior to it being submitted, right? Is that safe to say, right? Okay, so. Um, in, and I think that there's, uh, you know, that that kind of loops probably going to be in place for for a while as as people get confident that the the model is actually producing the, uh, the you know the the correct query. So yeah, so a quick uh, overview of what we learn what we learned. We kind of actually kind of talked about this already, but yeah, we only had like three weeks to do this, which is amazing that we completed something like this. I know in the AI world, three weeks is like. <laughs> a long time, but in development, that's not. Uh, we also were kind of like limited on, kind of on hardware. So uh, the demo that we'll show, we were actually, it's on a one a, 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 a V100 machine, uh, but in the learning process, Nikolai had uh, great uh, GPUs that he basically was able to take the Llama, take uh, the XML. So uh, we look, what we did was we took the XML from uh, we took some que old queries from the demo data site for the last like three years, which is like thirty thousand, I think. And then we took about ten thousand of them, and that's why Nicholas will explain how we kind of took that and taught it what ITB queries are like. And so 
as I said earlier, we needed to create an AI cell because it was just too much to do on the client. And uh, the, uh, the model is good, but it still doesn't, it has some AI hallucinations that Chris has talked about. It also kind of didn't really understand the Venn diagram. So I think next version, understand the Venn diagram, maybe it can use the plugin that Nick wrote, but okay. So I'm gonna let one of these. Um, so, so this is just a, a, a slide build of the, the kind of data flow workflow um, that we were just talking about in, in sort of another, another form. So um, we've got the, the I2B2 cell, right? So this is uh, part of the, the enclave, right? And we loaded that with uh, demo data. And then we took the, the, the information from the demo data and we brought it to uh, the export the query log, we brought that to um, a uh, uh, data center. Is it data center is the proper term? Basement. Uh, basement. Um, <laughs> in Michiko Labs, uh, where this three GPU rig uh, uh, lives. So, uh, you know, there were issues with um, with Safe Harbor and, and, and HIPAA and PAI, you know, uh, PHI and the like. Um, we we sidestep those uh, by using specifically the metadata in this case the uh, the uh, the query log uh, in XML, and so we took that query log and um, brought it over to um, to that uh, new um, um, site and we cleaned it, uh, randomized it, and tokenized it, right? So that prepared it for uh, inference, and then we we produced essentially two two data sets, two tokenized data sets out of that, a training data set and a test data set. The training data set then went into the LAMA2 uh, language model. Um, and uh, that's a, it's code LAMA built on LAMA2. And, and it's, it's, it was trained on about 500 billion tokens of code, right? So this is a code speaking language model. Um, it speaks XML it speaks uh, SQL, it speaks JSON, all, all of those. So um, one of the benefits here is that the same basic design can now be used to translate into multiple um, languages, right? Computer languages in this case. So, um, but there's also the, the issue about being able to run this back in the Enclave where you had a single GPU. We're running on three GPUs here. so. Uh, Nikolai ran a, a LoRa, which is a low ranked, basically a compression algorithm that takes the fine tuned um, XML queries and uh, along with the, uh, the, the model and compresses it um, to something that uh, can be run uh, on a single, um, single GPU. So it, it goes to down to four bits, uh, quantizes it down to four bits um, and um, yeah, so there's the val step. And then uh, Nikolai then merged those together into one single um, LoRa. So, so the represents the, both the, um, uh, the uh, uh, LAMA2, the code LAMA uh, model and the fine-tuned um, tasks on top of that. Yeah, and you could think of this as a stack of paper. So Meta releases code LAMA, which is a model that speaks all these languages, particularly good at code. Think of it as a stack of paper. It's all the training data that went in there, but it's merged down into one single file. So the part where we fine tune it basically creates another stack of paper. You know, it's maybe a few less pages, uh, but to get it to run effectively, load quickly, we don't want to go through the process of let's load the base model and then load the changes and maybe load more changes. You basically merge it down so that you can now go on Hugging Face, and I'll get into this in a moment, and just download the model and load it. So that's the whole point of merging. Uh, the model down, basically giving it one deliverable, one file you can then just load as a model. I also want to add about the learn what we learned. So we wanted to use a, a LoRa. We actually tried, but for some reason, it just wasn't working on my our MGB environment. So what Nicholas had to do was he had to create a whole new large model that we use, and actually that's available on his hugging base. So yeah, actually the um, the the name of the the merged uh, model is, uh, yeah, is right there. Let's go. I could be two thirty four B merged. 
All right. So, um, so we, so then we took that 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 lore, that merged uh, model, brought it back into the Enclave, um, wired it up with the the web UI, and um, and got it to produce uh, an XML query. There was some validation that gets run on that. There's a lot more work that needs to happen in in that area, um, but uh, um, essentially it it runs through the validation and then um, posts a, a, a message to the I2B2 server through the API and fires off the query. So that's essentially the kind of the training and workflow that we we went to 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 build this. So, all right, I'm gonna take it from here. And I'm just going to give a quick background on large language models, then we'll show a demo. And we'll go into some of the caveats of training, uh, including what happens when you just have XML, you don't really know what the researcher was looking for, um, and how we could use AI even just preparing training data. Um, so I've done this talk four times this week. We were at TechCrunch, G and myself, earlier this year. So if you don't know what a large language model, basically it may seem like magic. You go to chat GPT, um, like Sean, you said earlier, you know, it may seem like it's just input to output. And really that's what it is. It's a sequence to sequence generator. You put some text in, out comes other text, and how we trick this machine learning model into thinking really says a lot about you know, what we know about the space, what we know about intelligence. We could, could get into a philosophy question, um, but really it's state of the art. And there's a few players, Meta, thankfully, uh, thinks that it's best if AI models should be open source. So they, they release something called Llama, Llama 2, and Code Llama, which we're, we're working with today. Um, they think it's better if everyone has access to open source AI so they could generate more content for their platform, while the rest of these vendors up here think that it's a product. Personally, I think AI is a tool. So uh, thank you to Meta, Mark Zuckerberg, if you're watching this, probably not. They became much more open to open source after the model was leaked online, so. <laughs> <laughs> their hand was forced. Uh, so who knows what this is behind me? Anyone? So. As AI developers, we don't really have to know what it means, but this is the internal workings of an AI model. Really what this is, is it shows two things, an encoder and a decoder, which basically does what Sean mentioned earlier. It takes information, turns it into numbers, and then decodes it and turns it back out of numbers. So um, really, we don't have to know how a transformer works, but this is the architecture, that's what it's called. Um, all we really didn't need to know is this. And a little bit contrary to what, uh, what was said before, this is how most state-of-the-art models work today. You have some input, it's converted to numbers, you throw it in the model, treat it like a black box. All you have to know is keep track of your inputs, maintain a fidelity, make sure that all of your uh, you know, parameters to the model are remain you know, constant, and then out come some tokens, and then you get an output. So in this case, you know, I asked the model, how can I attend developer meetups for free food? And out it tells me exactly how I can attend developer meetups for free food. So how does it learn this? Well, they're trained on this huge, huge corpus of data um, that ranges everything from entire internet extracts. You wouldn't believe the entire internet, if you take away pictures and videos, isn't really that big. Um, it's trained on books, text, open source, closed source, you name it. These models have had that fed in the, in the, the tuning process. And here is uh, what I'll show you next is a more in-depth view of our exact process to get to a working AI model. Uh, and really what it is, it starts at model selection and ends at integration. So what we did is we started and said, hey, we need to select an AI model that's good at code. It can learn the I2B2 format. It can also do SQL, although, you know, that's not what this demo will show. So we want to take a good starting point where we know it almost kind of gets to where, we're, where we want to want to end. And we don't have to train it too much to really achieve the desired output. So we chose Meta's Llama, uh, the code Llama version, at 34 billion parameters. The parameter number doesn't really matter. Just know that to run this, you need a pretty beefy, either a V100 or larger GPU. Um, for those thinking in dollars and cents, think about $2,500 or more per GPU. Um, and that can be cost prohibitive, although there are some really awesome workings in this field where you could take a 34 billion parameter model and you can actually run that at high fidelity, high speed, directly on a MacBook Pro, uh, the latest version. So soon we'll see that these models can be run on pretty much commodity hardware, not yet. Maybe if you have a MacBook, you get lucky. Um, and it's an open model, so we can use it. There's an open license. I can make copies of it. I can put it on Hugging Face. Meta's okay with that. So the next thing is data collection. So 
how did we actually get the data? Well, Mike was gracious enough to prepare all the I2B2XML queries uh, from the Enclave. But key thing about it is there's no meaningful names or descriptions. There's no PHI. Um, there's no instructions. So we don't know what the researcher was looking for in that moment. We just know that, hey, this is XML. This query was run. So that was another challenge we had to get past. And I'll talk about that in a little. And then we had to uh, generate descriptions. So with this XML, we basically had to send it to a different AI model and say, hey, I've got this big XML query. What was the researcher asking for? So we actually asked the AI to describe these 30,000 queries. And what it did, it came back with great descriptions, good enough to train a model on. Uh, then we trained it. We tested it. So this was actually the most important part, this testing phase. Um, because if you don't test the output of the model, like, you know, someone like myself, I say, hey, that ontology key is perfect. And then Mike says, no, iSynth doesn't exist. You know, that's yes. a hallucination. Can I just explain a little bit about that? Just, uh, I just want to jump. This is the demo, the demo site, itv2.org slash web client. This is where anyone can go and do queries. These weren't like researchers at like UPID or other. These are people yep. basically playing around. And it gave us a good sample of what people were looking at. Some people just did circular tourists. Some people did temporal queries. But yeah, it's all fake, no, no real data at all. This is 133 patients. I just want to emphasize that. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. And one of the call to actions is if you want to contribute to a better model, um, you know, at the end, I'll ask, you know, please contact us and send us some queries, obviously, without PHI. Uh, certainly, we'd love to improve this along the way. And then finally, we integrate this into the UI. So Mike did most of the integration work to actually get this uh, built into the UI in a workable state, enough where a demo will actually populate a valid query from a natural language instruction. So. Um, that was the process. I'm going to hand this over to Mike to do a live demo, um, and we'll talk through what's going on in the background, um, and then we'll go through some of the cooler parts or the key steps behind the scenes. Thanks. Okay, so exit out of here. Um, oh yes, yeah, so I just wanted to emphasize. So we're actually going to load up the model. I'm going to show you how we load up the model. We're going to start up by to be two, which we've done before. We're going to just ask a question in the chat, so you can actually see the XML kind of generated. And then we're actually going to do the same question in the uh, web client. So, um, sorry, I have to take my glasses off. So, I am going to. So, I'm actually on the, the machine right now. And I just want to show you uh, a little bit. So, because I know you've used ChatGPT, but I want to actually show kind of like a little bit of the hardware for a second. Uh, so this is actually just a PowerEdge 97. And so if we were actually to switch over here, I'll get this thing out of the way. I'll get this thing out of the way. And basically it's that. That is, it's in Marlboro Data Center. And if we just take a look at this right here, do you see where uh, that is where the V100 uh, chip would, uh, the card would go. It's a GPU, it, it's plug it in and that's it. And so if I do a NVIDIA SMI, this is, that is a card. Okay, that is in, so <laughs> that's in the machine. And as you can see, it's kind of just doing the XOR very little being used by the GPU. Once we actually load up the model, we're going to run that command again, and you'll see that the thing takes up a lot of resource. So I am going to go into here, and now I am starting up the, all the Python scripts, and it also enables the API so that the ITP can actually communicate with it. So if we go, so this is basically starting a model server. And so it also comes with a web UI, so we can actually play around with it, almost like a playground to interact with the AI model. Um, and then from an API standpoint, then that's the backend integration. Right. Okay, so we're gonna go into models and I'm gonna load up the model. And load up the model. And as we can see, there's a ton of models that are available to us that we've downloaded and installed. This is also from the uh, testing. But this is the 34 March that Chris was talking about earlier. So this is the one that was merged together. 
And so then, as we mentioned before, we need to we need to specify some characteristics in loading this model. And one of them, obviously, is this four bit because it was downgraded to the four bit. The other thing I want to point out in this loading is we have two lines here. One is for the CPU, and one is for the GPU. So if you were to run this on your laptop, you might only just see that one line, that CPU. Um, and then you're like, oh, but you're saying zero. Basically, just let it figure out how much to use. And the only other parameter I need to change is the B float, okay? So once I hit load, you notice that this now is starting to load it up. And it's basically just, this will take a second to load up. <clears throat> so what's going on here in the background is there's the full precision model that takes, you know, probably a huge data center to run. Um, and then you are loading it up in four bit, which is downcast. So what uh, machine learning researchers have realized is that you can take a model and you can sort of just cut all the numbers to four bits it still works pretty much the same. And with large language models, that's really interesting because OpenAI spends, you know, millions of dollars running their servers every day. You know, Nikolai, uh, I can take their model, chop it to four bits and pretty much get the same output. So that's really interesting, especially for the research use case where anyone who doesn't have a gigantic hardware budget, um, you know, like I said, you can certainly run these on the latest MacBook. Um, and that's a, it's, it's a very interesting development that these things will get smarter and able to run on more commodity hardware, hopefully in the next year or so. Yeah. So this was the LoRa that we tried to use earlier, but it wasn't working. That's why we have to we merge it all into one. So we're just going to uh, gonna just do a simple query. Uh, let's make sure that the, just the Yeah, that's why I need to make sure the parameters. I think, which is, uh, should I do the Oh, it's my preset. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so in the chat, this is very similar to chat GPT because it's all loaded. I can say, uh, uh, what can I do in Boston? Okay. Fingers crossed it does. Yeah. <laughs> See, I mean, this is, and this is running on that GPU. Um, now the GPU is really cranking. Uh, Heating up the data center, but yeah. <laughs> See, I mean, this is so. This is. Oh, show you the GP processor. Okay, hold on a second. I have to log in. I yeah. No, it's still there. Okay. Yeah, I think I can do. I don't want to kill something that is alive. Right. Okay. Yeah. There's the process. So as you can see, it's using a lot of that GPU. That it's a 24 gig thing. So it's and yeah, it was fairly quick. It gave us all the responses. So now we're going to ask ask it uh, to give us the, basically a response in I to B two format. So we need to specify the parameter, which so I'm going to clear the history because it keeps a history of it. So now that we weren't doing I2B2 stuff, I think it might uh, start to get a little because the, the context window, the amount of memory that it has is, has been some of it's been consumed with that with that question. So we're, we're going to reset the context so that it's, it doesn't it's starting from scratch. It's like Drew, Drew Barrymore and 51st dates or whatever that movie was. Yes. And by the way, this ISO will be live and the whole system text generation web be live. All open source. Just type it into your machines right now and you'll go right to the kid and get all this. I have a question. <clears throat> yep. So, so the question is, uh, why didn't you adjust the temperature? So this is really interesting, actually. Um, so, and we'll get into this in the later slides after we show the real, the real uh, demo is when we generated the instructions, right? Um, we used a very specific preset. 
to get the highest quality instructions. What we found after testing the model was that if we adjusted the temperature down or changed any of those presets in generation, we would get more hallucinations. So basically we keep the temperature exactly the way we did when we generated the instructions, just because during the whole fine tuning process, we kept those as exactly the same. And so as we're doing the actual inference, we wanna make sure that the rest of the settings are more or less, more or less the same on this model. And this is this is a great question. So all of these parameters were actually um, were optimized. So the I believe the top P, which is the total set of next tokens to consider, is relatively low, and the temperature is relatively high. That was all computer optimized using a swarm optimization. Okay, so, so the question I'm asking though is that that would increase the variability in the response, right? So how close? When you re the same query, yep. how close are the outputs from, from the, the XML that was generated as outputs each time? Was it consistent or did it actually vary? So the evaluation loss, which is the difference between the test set and the model, what it produces from the same exact input query, was five tenths of a percent. So it's very, very, very close. That increases as you change the parameters just in either direction. So um, there's two presets here, this one, the intellect one, and then my preset is actually the one that's trained. So if we could, we could try both and see the differences. The model will output different things based on the parameters, and it's really important. Uh, part of the, what I ship on Hugging Face is the exact parameters used. And, and given more time, I think it would be interesting to sort of explore, uh, you know, where the best setting for that is. I mean, it, it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very literal uh, um, output. Right, so um, you don't need necessarily need a whole lot of uh, creativity uh, right. in, in, in that. In that, so yeah. Uh, so I everything is set with this one. Yeah, right. If you can. Yeah, I think this is right. No, it's I to be too. I need. I've done this before. Okay. If now we, we'll find out that it doesn't regenerate. So I'm asking it a question. And as you can see, it's generating. So this is what the live demo is actually going to do. It's going to communicate with this interface through the API. And it is going to take this amount of time. It's going to take about uh, 100 seconds to actually generate because I only have one C a GPU. We've actually talked about, because we've made it into uh, an AI cell, we don't actually have to export this anymore. Yep. We can actually export JSON because whatever happens in the cell, can, doesn't, it can do whatever it wants because all it just has, has to accept ITV2 XML and export XML. So this could actually just be, it could look like the, qu the query. You could have like all the items and then the value, like less than whatever values. So it would be a lot quicker. Yep. And, and a few comments here is that this is a full fine tune on the XML data, meaning when we train the model, what we did was we said, here's the instruction. I want to find patients with diabetes over 65. That's a great template example we used when, when doing the integration. We trained it on the entire XML query, but a lot of that is boilerplate. And so one of the things going forward we can think about to increase this time or decrease this time, increase the sort of user speed is instead do a, you know, really shrink down the query of what it's generating. Um, and in a much shorter format, you know, generate exactly what you see here. Yeah. A lot of this is XML tags. So it did a great job of giving me exactly the XML tags I want, but for the user experience, um, you know, the next iteration will, should be a lot faster. You know, this is just a great first pass. Yeah, I mean, just want to point out the item key. I mean, that item key, when I saw it, I was like, yeah, that's correct. It's ICD-10 and ICD-9, that is your table access diagnosis that looks all beautiful but then it's probably at the very end where it has that xh9z that's probably not correct and so that that is why i had to take the item name and actually get the proper one because it would hallucinate a little bit on that last bit uh so now i'm actually going to take that same query and just run it into the itv2 so so i took the name um, so if I go back here, I took 
this item name and I sent that to the ontology cell. And then I came back with uh, the list and I just, whichever one was the proper one, I used that item key. Yeah, we find that the item name is almost always correct. We yeah. have about a thousand samples. The item key is always <laughs> a little off. You know, it's the tildes and the names, they're just slightly off, which is expected. That's hallucination in an AI model. Um, so we can work around that with the actual front end integration. Right. And so it's, from an LLM perspective, it's post processing. We're doing essentially replacing the item key with the with yeah. the known validated key. We'll yeah. show you the guardrails, basically. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it gets corrected. We yeah. get the correct one because if we were to take that one and run it through, right. uh, the CSC would say unknown ontology because it would try to use that key. So yeah, so we installed ITP two on this that machine, and so uh, we then. I've done this So I thought I had everything set up so I could just start it, but I'm doing everything from one term only. So now I'm starting up Wildfly and I'm going, let's see. Lots of mouse, okay. So I'm gonna, and I'm going to select uh, the Oracle demo one. And this is where it comes. So this has been a, a modified UI that will actually accept uh, text. And this would be very similar to the other text. And so if we were to copy in uh, that same question, this, once I hit return, it's gonna communicate to the ITB2 AI cell. It's gonna take that, it's then gonna communicate through the API to the AI it's gonna get that response back and it's gonna come back in 180 seconds. It's gonna then take that XML, it's then gonna basically validate to make sure it's valid XML. Once it does that, it's gonna go through each of the panels and it goes to each of the items. And then once it takes the item, it then communicates with the uh, ontology cell, which it will then regenerate a whole new query definition XML, which will take that one with all the proper items and the names, sends that to the CRC to say execute, and then we'll get back a patient number. So it's a lot done, it looks like. So once that's running, it, this has now been communicating with it. And so through the magic of Food Network, if we log in, Get this early beautifully. Come on. Um, and if this is good, uh, so this is that uh, response time we were talking about with um, the model taking a while. So um, one of the key areas for improvement is definitely speed. Um, but moreover, having a smaller model where you can run it on commodity hardware. Um, for example, you can run the seven billion version of this model on a laptop today. So if you have um, you know, the ability to run a local model, that could also inform the same I2B2 query um, as well. And the idea is that it should really learn the output with all the core model information and be able to display it right on screen like you see. So the idea is the natural language text, whatever you put into it, should really learn from that demo data set. 
Um, there were about 26,000 sample queries, which is about enough for it to start learning. Um, and with enough training, enough iterations through the data set, you know, we can get it to a point <clears throat> where both big models, small models, and large can basically work directly in, in the data set. And there's a lot of improvements. Imagine now, Nikolai, I've never seen the I2B2 data set. I can say, hey, I want to find all patients with diabetes over 65. I want to find all patients with Crohn's disease under 40, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There we go. I've got my query. It can be validated by a researcher. It can be validated by others. I don't have to learn about ontologies. I don't have to learn about the local code sets or keys. And certainly, I understand that there's probably variations between all the other I2B2 installations. And so that's really important because you don't have to worry that Nikolai's model was trained on ICD-10, but we use a local code set. You just should just work. So. Right. So this, this is the one that came back from the model, and it came back with three panels. Um, and so it, it was accurate. The only one thing was, yes, it, we asked it about bronchodilators, which is a medication, but it also brought in medication. Uh, so the result would actually come out correct because we're saying, I wanna know all these patients. And at first the medications would be like almost everyone because someone, everyone had at least a medication. But once you do the bronchodilators, it now will narrow it down. Um, ITB2, just as a side note in the back end, would have done the smallest ones possible and then do the large ones. So it would have been fairly quick anyway because it, it would have thrown away the medication. Because it's like, uh, but yeah, so that that's, that's the, de the demo. And ta-da. Uh, all right. nice. yeah. <laughs> uh, and so yeah, so let's jump to the uh, oh shoot, uh, actually I didn't kill anything, so that's good. Oh jeez. Yeah, check, check. Um, okay. Uh, demo. Okay. So yeah. So there's a, there's a few key steps I want to talk about just because it's really interesting. Um, so uh, part of tra tra training, fine tuning the model, you know, that's pretty straightforward. You got sample data and then you want the model to output something uh, that's known and expected. But what happens if you don't have an instruction, you don't have sample data? So up here on this side, what you see, that's I2B2 XML. It's just XML, it's XML markup. I don't know what the, pa what the researcher was looking for. They don't tell us uh, the name of the query. And like Mike said, this is an open source uh, open uh, platform where someone can come and say, I'm doing these queries, it gets saved, but they didn't write a description, they didn't say their intent, they didn't say what they were trying. So this came up, up with a really interesting problem is, how do I figure out what the researcher was looking for? So uh, the approach that we took was actually just ask the AI model what was going on in the background. So it's, it's, it's really funny to say like AI will make data for retraining other AIs. Um, but we're very much at that stage in AI development. So you ask AI to process based on the above I2B2 XML query, and the core model did know about the star schema, which is really interesting. Um, what was the researcher asking? Start with, I want to find. And what came back were really, really descriptive queries coming from the XML. So things like, I want to find all patients who've had any procedure related to the respiratory system. You know how researchers can get. We might put this really, really long description of what's going to happen. And so the model did a fantastic job. Uh, we actually used a different model to do this processing, um, a, a bigger version of LAMA actually. And it came back with really for all these 26,000 samples, it came back with fantastic uh, descriptions where we went through the first hundred or so and said, you know, we don't even have to check the rest of them because we know that these are just such high quality in their, in their generation. And so this is really, really cool because now we can take this approach for a variety of other methods. We've proved that you can generate XML and have it be self-generating almost, where we say, here's XML, or what, is, what was the intent behind it? By the way, retrain another model to generate more XML. And so this circular mentality, something you think that maybe a person might do, um, is actually very possible with these AI models. So the data processing actually took longer than fine tuning. This took about four and a half days on multiple different parallelized models, um, it wasn't fast. We mostly because the throughput of all this data for inference happened to be slower and a bigger model than the actual fine tuning run uh, needed. And then the key step on training was that uh, it needed a lot of hardware. Um, so uh, luckily, I have a my own models, my own hobby where I 
create medical models, mostly for open source. Um, and for all the outputs and artifacts from the machine learning standpoint, it's all hosted on Hugging Face. If you're not familiar with Hugging Face, Hugging Face is the GitHub equivalent of machine learning models. So people go up and post models and they say on their Hugging Face spaces, they compete in leaderboards. And the total training run took about two, two and a half, three days. In fact, the final model we took was from about halfway through the training run that had the best uh, sort of statistics on the accuracy and evaluation. And um, total training was about 271 quadrillion floating point operations. I didn't think that number was right when I looked at the logs, but it was. Um, so you could think about that. That's how much crunching was done um, in the background. And so if you're, if you're interested in downloading these models yourself, you're interested in looking at the code and the logs of how it was trained, the data, and the models are all open source on Hugging Face slash and Mitchco. So you can go ahead, play with it, try training yourself, uh, you know, have a blast. And, uh, and Mike's stuff is all on GitHub. So all of the AI cells, all the AI code, the front end integration is on GitHub as well. So you can see those links over here on the left. And so our sandbox, and you did see a little bit of it, um, this is just a snapshot of if you do want to set up the web client, uh, the web UI for this model hosting is up in the top left here. Uh, you could just download this model link. So nmitchgo, i2b2 query builder, 34 billion merged. And then we have some suggested parameters uh, if you have enough hardware. This will probably take, uh, if anyone's familiar with consumer grade graphics cards, uh, GT, uh, RTX 3090 could run this model. So, you know, it's not totally out of reach for the modern consumer. You know, certainly if you are, you're a, have a gaming PC, you can run this model. Um, so certainly feel free to try it, run it, you know, play around with the web UI um, and play around with the I2B2 cell and client. And of course, this wouldn't be a Nikolai presentation without some photos. So um, this is what the sandbox looked like. This is from earlier this summer. Um, basically, uh, we went down to Micro Center, had a server rack. I put this together uh, for a different project actually in early May. Um, but uh, certainly this thing is loud. Uh, it's going to, you know, drastically reduce my heating bill this winter. Um, and it's, uh, my AC bill is out the roof this summer. So um, this is what we wanted to present today. In overall, this model can basically take text, turn it into an I2B2 query. I'm excited because I knew nothing about the query builder. I knew SQL, but certainly it enables someone like me. I can go in and type my commands. Hopefully that enables a whole breed of researchers outside this room to do the same. Um, and overall, uh, just thanks for listening to us today. Um, here are our both personal and professional emails. Please email us if you have any questions or are interested. Um, and yeah, we'll take any more questions if you have them. Uh, very cool. Uh, thank you for sharing. Quick question. So the test data set you use, it's generated also from the AI model, right? Like the instructions. So what's the plan moving forward to create a validatable, like, uh, you know, evaluation set uh, so you can, you know, release the model with confidence to the community? It's a really good question. There are a few open source tools. And actually, one of the calls to action we had thought about was um, contributing queries, but also your generation of what you were doing with this query. Now, I know that not everyone writes this down and that's hard to do for query history, um, but we have, uh, there's a tool, it's open source called Label Studio. Um, and more or less what it does, it allows a human to review AI generated data, particularly for this exact use case. And so uh, a next step certainly would be to have researchers who know what the query was doing, maybe even include the I2B2 UI and say, all right, what was going on here? with that XML that was part of the test data set, and then have them adjudicate or basically say, yep, the AI generated response was okay. That is what the researcher was looking for, or it wasn't, it's too wordy, or it needs to be changed or a different format. So um, the sort of mentality was, we didn't do that yet, but for a long-term project, certainly would have to be done the data quality. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't just answer the question that was also put in the chat. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so yeah, we trained the model on some demo data, but yeah, we need to. Uh, so I think the, the goal would eventually would be to, you know, to 
establishes is reinforcement learning of some type. Um, right now, it's sort of out of band uh, validation is probably the best way to think about it. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. Um, have you tried um, assessing the complexity, like of those queries, like uh, for exclusion or more complicated booting um, structure inside, or maybe you can get it statistics from the, the the training testing data like the percentage of those we st uh, we did a little bit of that yes that's an excellent question because yes if you try to do temporal queries or even like values uh we started to utilize, uh, started to evaluate it and look at it uh due to the fact that we only had a very limited three-week period and we only just started to get the query running within the last like so, week so and like, a half so like, we weren't able to Fully implement. Yeah, the I think it, it, we were we were we were bound by the um, the distribution of, of the of the demo uh, the, the, the demo um, instance, right? right? So all the queries that were in the demo instance. So if, to the to the degree that they represented, you know, the kind of queries that you're interested in, you know, we're, we we really didn't we weren't able to take that into consideration. Uh, but one last. Uh, it actually did have stuff about modifiers and values, so it did understand it. It was just that it wasn't fully trained. And yeah. so, it'd be yeah. interesting to know how how it handles those more complicated, you know, negation and. Uh, it, it did because I, I mean, I can try to type something in and see what happens. No, it's still, <laughs> I, mean, the, I can't yeah, guarantee that this will be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so beautiful, the, but we can actually enter in something and. Uh, and the AI generated um, instructions that were uh, were were generated from the individual input queries were uh, limited to about 256 words. So um, we're kind of relying on the AI to extrapolate on what was really meant. Um, but certainly, multiple panels, multiple inclusion exclusion criteria were there, and there were some queries. So this model uh, is 16,000 context length. So the point of that huge context like this, it should be able to emit a gigantic XML query, probably not optimal for production, but certainly it has the ability to give you something really long. Um, and certainly something we'd be looking to do yeah, in the one, future. Also one direction from inspired by what you describe the method, it, it can probably modulize because they can artificially create your own XML structure and bury some of those things to, and then, you know, the engineering. So that's the reinforcement learning process Chris mentioned is that we would then have the AI emit something and then we would have a team of researchers or someone go in and say from one to five how good was this query and then if the query wasn't good they would go in and engineer their own query and that second part of training is called reinforcement learning where you don't just teach the content like we've done you then start to teach it preference. Yeah. yeah. So that's the next step. Okay, cool. so I'm going to do a query. I want to find all patients with hemoglobin A1C with a value over 6.7. So, do I do I, I clear the history first? Oh, clear the history. Okay. Clear the history. Confirm. Okay, and here it goes. <laughs> okay, hemoglobin A1C. Got the name right. That's good. Um, what you'll find interesting is it gives it a time to the query, so it doesn't know the current time; it just makes one up. You know, oh, that's at the interesting. Top. Yeah. At the reach level, so you may get a limit too. So once it stops, you may just want to hit. Oh. Uh, well, I, I put the thing at tw uh, twenty fourteen. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So endocrine disorders. I'm not sure where it got that from. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, well, well I'll ask some yeah. questions while this thing is running. No, take your time is finish uh, generating. No, it, it's it's going to run because uh, it's found some endocrine disorders. I'm not sure why it's not part of it. He will go on A1C, <laughs> but I'm well, not I'm not a medical person, so so A1C <laughs> would be associated with diabetes, which would be an endocrine disorder with with Actually, pancreas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, very. Thank you for the presentation. It's a very timely attempt. Um, interesting attempt as well because I, I know the code lemma has just been released recently. 
Um, so my, my question is like you mentioned about gut wheels, right? Uh, I, I'm wondering what kind of like libraries or like packages or techniques have you tried and what's the level of success and how would you improve upon that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I just missed the part. You said uh, you were wondering about uh, gut wheels, like yes. fact checking, hallucination, biases. So <laughs> this is a huge issue in I think any AI in healthcare, which is uh, and there's a concept in large language models called function calling. So um, a great example I like to give is imagine you hook this up to patient messages in your EMR and Nikolai comes in and says, please prescribe me some milligrams of oxycodone. And then I put some special string at the end. And then tomorrow I go to CVS and I pick up something. That's a huge risk. And so if we start integrating AI, you have to put in guardrails that A, there needs to be a human adjudication of any action and B, for any item that's verifiable, for example, concept keys like Mike has programmed and others, you need to really harden down the guardrails. Now, luckily, it's just building a query here. So we're not taking any patient action. We're really not taking any, you know, PHI or life-changing sort of, uh, you know, action here. But for example, just having the ability to show the query and we're not executing it automatically. That's at a highest level, the best guardrail you could do. The second best guardrail you could do is verify the individual concepts. And then from there, we could even feed it back to a separate AI model to ask, what's wrong with this query? What could I do different? Or are there any risks to patient health if I run this query? So we've implemented two of the guardrails that at least at a high level, I think are important, which is person adjudication and then verification. The last one, which is sort of re-verification with an AI, probably you know, not out of scope for the POC. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Um, and regarding the, I, I, no, I noticed there's something correct. Are you guys using Rack in this, um, um, like solution? Like, um, so I, we I don't think it's use resources augmented yep. uh, generation, correct? So there is an opportunity to do retrieval augmented generation. Um, Rag for everyone is just, you know, basically what Sean described is take my ontology of some information and whether it's PDFs, whether it's the current ontology, we had thought about that to actually verify the ontology keys. And we do, when we do RAG there, retrieval augmented generation against the concept keys, it works, it works first shot, you know, no, no verification or anything. Uh, however, it's just, um, it was just a little too quick to, to implement that last step. Certainly it wouldn't take more than a week or two to then load up your, you know, sites ontology, to a, a Chroma DB or another vector database, query it with my instruction and say, use these potential keys in your response. That actually works perfectly here. So it's something we considered, didn't get a chance to implement, but certainly would be a great um, thing for concept keys, as well as you know, any other content that's get, put into the query. Awesome. Thank so you. if we take a look at it, it actually was pretty good, except it wanted to throw us in, into the modifier. But it did actually put in the value constraint of 6.7 and said GT for the value operator and then the value type of something. So it was actually, it's pretty good. I mean, I'm impressed. I mean, it could replace me. No way. <laughs> okay, you have a question? I just want to say it's amazing that uh, how like see you guys do that and I was actually this idea was actually from the the queen of the ontology in this room and I'm not allowed to her say name <laughs> it was it was we discussed this idea it was her idea that she wanted to do something like a chatbot because back then like when when sheriff was first developed mm -hmm. and we were saying well what if we do some chatbot for the researchers don't know how to write queries and then they just type in stuff and we extracted the um the you know ICD code and stuff behind it and translate it for them and make into access ML and then it can automatically run the query, can create a phenotype, can like do a lot of things, but you know, like never implement it. And then but now, like, you know, because larger language model, it's become possible. So you guys open a like a Pandora's box for her. Yeah. You're I welcome. Mean, we can work with the entire I love working with the ontology group on improving this because as you can see, it's not perfect. I mean it's really good, but it's not and so more, So there's a lot of things like that that we can work through. Yeah. 
And you just spawned a few thoughts in my head. We had discussed um, what would be the next steps for AI. Um, it could be, you know, picking the correct ontology, you know, automatically pulling in the concepts like, like I mentioned with retrieval augmented generation. But what about ETL? We all have data sources that are various different shapes and sizes. What about AI ETL uh, into the product? And then moreover, what if AI could suggest to us which queries we should be running? Where should we be researching? So there's a huge, like, like you said, we opened Pandora's box, uh, but for the better. This will enable much better research um, on the platform. Yeah. I mean, one thing, this, this could be a dialogue, right? It doesn't have to be a one-shot you know, set of queries. It could be like, you know, what are the diabetes uh, terms that I could use here? Like, well, oh, I can use this and this. Like, oh, well, what about that? And then they can hone in on the right thing and so forth, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that was good. Yeah, good job. Good job. Good job. <laughs> so I don't want to throw you guys off, but it's it's five o'clock and everybody's it's five ready. <laughs> it's five yeah. o'clock somewhere. This um, I yeah, th thanks thanks yeah. a lot for this. I I um. I sat through three weeks of meetings with these guys. And of course I sat on Zoom and multitask. I had no idea this was really going on. This was awesome. This is really awesome. Um, I don't know if people remember when Mike talked about his ETL working group today, he talked about like sort of merging it and creating an AI working group. And I think that like, there's, you know, there's some definitely energy in the room. Maybe yeah. we can kind of, you know, get that going uh, and uh, pull together more of these people that are have interest in this because uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, and anyway, I I had planned on having like a, a wrap up session at the end of this uh, this meeting for like an hour where I could get you know comments and feedback from people. Um, are there any? Is there anything else anybody wants to say about how the conference went? What they want to talk about? I mean, you can always fill out the survey, which do that. But any any other. I know it's been a long couple of days. Kavi. I want to comment on two things. One of the big things about this is that there's a lot of demo design that was in the presentation. After the first thing, we have five presentations and hundred ten people. But teams come in, and almost all the presenters that showed live, that was an outstanding for the demo for the team. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, today was more live demos. We tried to make the today more of a like technical kind of um, day. Yesterday, I think was really good. I think yesterday was too packed. The agendas was too packed. There wasn't enough time for questions. Today was better, so we have to do a better job with that. But those, that's the kind of feedback I really want um, from from folks. From like just anything. Any any other anything else? Folks wanted to like say, or <laughs> and these guys are leaving. The pit folks are leaving. They're done. Bye. <laughs> no. All right. Well, thank you so much for attending, and um, let's keep this going. I just uh, one comment. I I know Amia. Um, is in uh, Boston in March. So like, I'd love to, you know, at least for the, the local people, although I think most of the <laughs> folks here are not local, um, but I, or people are coming to Amy in March. I'd like to figure out how to have um, something, um, I, you know, on a small, much smaller scale where there's a half a day or a few hours where we get together. Maybe it's the AI working group. Maybe that thing gets going and that we, we have a really, an AI, I mean, really, an AI session, um, something like that. <laughs> that thing scares me, Mike. I don't know, really know if I'm going to be using that. Anyway, all right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. And, you know, <laughs>